welcome back to the China Puzzles News Wrap. This week, G7 members met in person in London and China was a key agenda item with uh, UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson and US Secretary of State, State Anthony Blinken uh, talking about how aligned the US and the UK are on foreign policy. Yeah, they did. And I think um, one of the kind of key kind of like actions from that has been the announcement that the uh, British aircraft carrier, Queen Elizabeth II, is actually going to be deployed um, to the Asia Pacific and it's going to be working along with allies, say Australia, the US, Japan, Korea, in the kind of like heavily contested waters of the China South Sea. So, I mean, that's a very big, bold action, considering that the Queen Elizabeth II is a very new aircraft carrier. It's probably its first big deployment and it's going to be a significant presence in the area. I mean, it will be the largest deployment of F-35 fighters um, that the world's seen as well. So it's absolutely a powerful message <laughs> to China that the Britain is back. Yeah, that definitely. <laughs> um, but I think a story that sort of flew more under the radar this week was the UK Foreign Affairs Committee hearing and some comments that the UK Minister for Asia, Nigel Adams, made about the importance of the UK-China um, economic relationship. Yeah, and I think it was very interesting that because uh, the UK Parliament has just put forward a motion declaring genocide uh, with the Uyghur population in China, and this was a slight bounce against that, slight bounce against that. So one of the things that um, Nigel Adams really spoke about was the impact of the China relationship and to jobs, quoting that, you know, there's thousands of jobs that are based on Chinese enterprise. Um, so that was kind of an interesting point that he put out there, that there has to be some cooperation. Yeah, definitely. And that message was reinforced with um, some data through an investigation by the Sunday Times that says that the Chinese investment, the value of mm. Chinese investment in the UK is more than double what they previously thought it was. Um, and I think the figure came to about $135 billion. So it's, it is a pretty significant um, proportion and, and you know, it shows the, the value and the kind of reach of Chinese capital in this country. Yeah, 100%. I think it really, you know, if we see that when China is told to stop investing in a country like Australia, for example, you do see a, a strong kind of reaction. And so they, the UK, UK could be faced in a situation where they could maybe lose 90% of that. If, mm. if, you know, if, if China decides to pull that up, yeah, there will be action on that. Absolutely. This kind of concern um, was raised this week uh, at a Chatham House event where the former US Secretary of State Hillary Clinton warned about economic reliance on China and really sort of encouraged uh, Western economies to invest in their own supply chains again and, and really build back kind of manufacturing capabilities across a range of sectors because for the last you know 10 years or so or 20 years we've been so reliant on that Chinese um, supply chain so mm. that's something that um, increasingly people are looking towards their domestic capabilities to counter. Absolutely and I think um, it all kind of links back and it's somewhat related to COVID but we're drawing back on history so if you look to World War II the Keynesian approach to um, dealing with the Great Depression. I think this is the kind of lesson they're learning. It's like, we can actually stimulate our own domestic economies now by re-establishing um, slightly more expensive manufacturing. Mm. <laughs> but that's how um, China, uh, the US um, after World War II was able to rebuild um, Europe's and large parts of Asia because they had this amazing manufacturing made in the USA it was a sign of quality. Yeah. Well, staying on Europe that you mentioned, um, mm -hmm. last year in an episode, we uh, talked about a big announcement that was the EU-China investment deal that was signed, uh, and that was expected to be negotiated over the next couple of years before being ratified. We've just heard that that uh, agreement um, or talks for the agreement have been uh, stalled. S suspended, yeah. yeah. suspended. So, I mean, that's quite a big deal because it was hailed as a great achievement to sign this intention of doing a big EU-China deal um, and now the European Commission has said that 
due to some of the other ongoing tensions, the sanctions that have been applied between the two countries in relation to um, the issue of human rights concerns in Xinjiang, that those economic talks are stalled, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, and that's the interesting thing, it is the European Commission here. They're not exactly lockstep with um, UK or US um, mm. policy decisions. So it's quite an interesting thing that even a broader front of countries are now starting to realise the issues of like um, China's um, human rights um, issues. So. And talking about economic dialogues being stored, <laughs> we've had some big news out of Australia in a further deterioration of the Australia-China relationship. Yeah, absolutely. So the Australian-China economic dialogue has been suspended. Um, what that basically comes down to is everything below minister is no longer um, they, we can't have civil servants talking to each other, talking about these kind of economic issues. That normally wouldn't be an issue, but for the fact that um, Australia and Chinese ministers have not been speaking to each other mm. for several years now. So there's a huge swathe of Australia's largest trading partner who now they have no access to um, Chinese bureaucrats and discussions that happen with regards to treasury, trade, and those mm. kind of things. I think. It's, it's a really kind of like dangerous point. Like it is a big move. It doesn't sound like much. Yeah, I think it's quite, I mean, the federal government in Australia is sort of trying to downplay it, but other analysts are saying this is huge because it was the primary platform for dialogue between the two countries and to talk about the economic relationship. Um, and some are saying it's a bit of a retaliation from China mm. on other recent issues such as um, the federal government um, sort of effectively cancelling some agreements between the Victorian government and China for their Belt and Road initiative. So it's just another example of, you know, things are not going well between the two countries and it can continue to escalate. And now that there's really no mechanism for nutting out these issues, whether it's ministerial level, whether it's the civil servants, mm. um, effectively that dialogue is completely closed off. Yeah, and I mean, I think we can all agree that, um, you know, dialogue is probably the best way forward in improving economic trade conditions between the two. So it's, mm -hmm. it's a really damaging move. Um, and it doesn't seem like it, anything's going to improve over the next period, no. is it? No, no we'll have to wait and see.